Hey, Calvary, it's so good to be with you today. This is the weekly, and this is special edition, the book list. We have a great book for you queued up for your summer reading, or end of summer reading, I should say. My name is Jay. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary, and I have two special friends in the booth, the familiar Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, friends. And then, Melissa, you want to introduce our guest today? Yeah, our guest is the one and only Ellie Pickett. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so good to be with you. We, a couple months ago, asked Ellie to pick up a book with us, a really great book. We're going to talk about one of my heroes of the faith, actually, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, a book I read several years ago that I love dearly, and I hope that at the end of this podcast, you pick it up. It's in the show notes, so go to the link. I don't get any credit from Amazon for you clicking on that link. I should set that up. (laughs) (laughs) But... You should pick this book up. It's a great book. It's in the Erie Library because I can see that Melissa has checked it out of the Erie Library. It's probably overdue. (laughs) You haven't got phone calls yet? I think I've renewed it three times. I would just recommend buying it. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to have it a while. (laughs) Yeah. Ellie and I share a great love. I know Melissa probably doesn't, but Ellie and I share a great love of Star Wars. Everything Star Wars. Sorry to break it to you, but... You forgot your Star Wars shirt today. Oh, Jay, is that a Star Wars shirt shirt you're wearing? No, it's a Calvary Bible shirt. Same thing. I do. I like Star Wars. I appreciate Star Wars. I enjoy Star Wars, but I don't think I have the same deep love and affinity. I appreciate that you guys have it. Jesus teaches forgiveness. (laughs) Therefore, I have to forgive you. Ellie has an extreme love of Star Wars. Her family does as well. And their house and their cars and their tattoos. (laughs) So are all great. Star Wars. I love it. <laughs> it's so awesome. I love it. And we actually convinced Ellie to read this book while she was taking our photographs. Yeah. As part of our headshots that she does for Calvary. So if you want to see her amazing work, number one, her Instagram account. Right. Always has nope. great people. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Just I don't kidding. have Instagram. <laughs> you used to. You had headshots for a while. On yeah. Instagram. Okay. Well, okay. the better place to see them is <laughs> yeah. calvarybible.com. There you go. She takes all of our staff and elder photos and she makes this look amazing. She does. Not hard. Uh, anyways, she, she is just so generous with her time to even read this book with us because I, when I asked her to read a book, I don't think she knew how many pages this book would be. I thought this book was more of a prop. <laughs> it was. It, it was a prop. And with it or? A prop yeah. gone yeah. wrong. I mean, <laughs> right, but also wrong. This yes. is our longest book recommendation so it far. Is. So, so it far. is uh, <laughs> 542 pages. Which, 542 challenging pages. Okay, we've talked enough. We, we should tell them what this book is. Oh. Tell them the, what this book is. We Good haven't even idea. said the book. Great. So we read uh, Bonhoeffer. Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy by Eric Metaxas. Um, And it's a comprehensive review of one of history's darkest eras, along with a fascinating exploration of the family, cultural, and religious influences that formed one of the world's greatest contemporary theologians. Uh, In this book, he traces Bonhoeffer's developing call to be a Jeremiah-like prophet in his own time and a growing understanding that the church was called to speak for those who could not speak. Metaxas details Bonhoeffer's role in religious resistance to Nazism and provides a compelling account of the faith journey that eventually involved the Lutheran pastor in unsuccessful attempts to assassinate Hitler. Yeah. If you don't want to read that book now, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to get you to read any book. Yeah. Because that was a great intro. I love, I love Bonhoeffer. So just full disclosure, I read Bonhoeffer in Bible college years ago. And like his actual writings, his actual writings yeah. and um, have been deeply shaped by Bonhoeffer and his writings. So when Eric McTexas wrote this book, it came out, I picked it up and I couldn't p- put it down. I think actually I was single at the time. So full credit there, but <laughs> I had plenty of time on my hand, but I read it in two days. No. This was, uh, this is how good that book was for me. I read that book in two days. I don't believe him. Yeah. I, don't I was single. I was like, it was a free weekend I, and I couldn't put it down. I just went so to the So what you're saying is you're single and you had zero life otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> totally. There's no way our friends are going to be able to 
you know, meet that expectation. No, okay, then nor should you. You know what? Let's manage expectations yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit. So Ellie, how long have we had this book for? Two months. We've had it for <laughs> two months and Ellie killed it. She actually read the whole book. Yeah. I had some long flights. Yeah. It's they were helpful. Uh, Melissa, not so much. She made it halfway through. I think two months is actually a really I think it is too. good time frame. If you like to read, you know, an hour or two a day. Right. No, I, seriously, it was such a page turner for me because Bonhoeffer is a hero of mine. So it was easy. It's like someone getting the first Harry Potter book. You know, people would read that book yes, in a day. And it, you also had the uh, context right. of Bonhoeffer and his writings and yes, his history and a lot true. of that stuff. Whereas Ellie and I were like, let's Google that and find out more. Yeah, no doubt. So if you don't know Bonhoeffer, I want to introduce you to Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He was born in 1906 and he lived through 1945 in Germany is sort of his backstory. In fact, he ended up dying in a concentration camp, which the book goes into great detail in 1945, April 9th. Um, and he was hung at dawn um, for his his faith and for his, his, um, his convictions and some of the uh, people groups that he found himself in because of those things. So uh, really interesting man. He was a young man who was born and raised through the Great War, and then uh, he saw his country go through that and come out of that um, with Germany. And If you know your World War II history, that was a really difficult time for Germany. And then he also was a young man, high school, college, post-college, living through a uh, Nazi regime of Germany and seeing his friends and family and his country sort of go through these ebbs and flows of two horrific wars two interesting, very um, evil leaders and just the implications that would be to anyone. And then he had a faith. He had a faith in Jesus. He loved Christ and had a deep love for the scriptures. And that's what Metaxas, I think, carries really well through the book. I think I love how Metaxas really talked about why Bonhoeffer knew and loved the scriptures so much. It's because he was born of a scientist of his family was so prestigious and so well educated right. that he approached this. I mean, his mother's side of the family was more the believing side, and so he had you know an idea, a curiosity, mm -hmm. and after all this research, mm -hmm. he couldn't help but keep researching, keep researching, and eventually, I think he just discovered that it was God's calling. Yeah, for him. What do you think is one of the characteristics that sticks out to you the most then with Bonhoeffer in reading his biography, this biography? I think um, just how he led first with love with the people that were in relationship with him, around him. Like he just had a passion for learning, like you were talking about, Ellie. And he just, every situation that he was in, whether that was here in the United States on his visits or in Rome or in Germany, England, that he uh, sought to empathize and totally understand the culture that he was in, the Christians that he was around, and what God was doing in their lives and what God could do through him in their lives. That's really good. What about you, Ellie? I think for me, to add on to that, he would love people and then also preach the absolute mm -hmm. truth, black and white, as it is written in the word of God, which was unusual at that time. Yeah. Uh, he was quite a pioneer and was not received well initially um, or even in the end by a lot of people. I just loved how he took the word of God with the most seriousness that one can take it and sense of urgency, so much so that it challenged me and my heart to want to adopt that same sense of urgency. Why do I feel like Christ can be just kind of a little bit related to me. No, he is all right. of who I am and all of what I should be pursuing. And I think uh, he and his teachings completely epitomize that idea. Yeah, yeah, I love that quote that you were sharing before. Do you want to read it? I want to read it. Yeah. Okay. This was the one quote that stuck out to me the most in this book. He said, should there be something in Christ that claims my life entirely with the full seriousness that here God himself speaks? And if the word of God once became present only in Christ, then Christ has not only relative, but absolute urgent significance for me. 
Understanding Christ means taking Christ seriously. Understanding this claim means taking seriously his absolute claim on our commitment. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I think we compartmentalize so much in our uh, society and just where we are in life that we have our, we have our church life and our church friends and we have our work life and our work friends and our kids kids they go to school with and their parents that are friends and we kind of like to put those all in boxes and so it's so encouraging to see somebody like this that just takes such a strong faith and just blankets his whole life with it it's and a it reversal. applies to everything yeah because for us I found well for me I find myself trying to relate Christ to the things I'm doing in my life to the kids at school to mm-hmm. even myself here at church is as terrible as that realization just is instead it really should be God first and we all say it Oh, yeah, God first. Mm -hmm. But is that actually how we're living day to day? And Bonhoeffer perfectly walked that walk. Maybe not perfectly, but very, very good example of what it looks like to actually put Christ first in whatever situation you're in instead of the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good sort of insight to who Bonhoeffer was and sort of his influence even as we read. But how would you summarize Bonhoeffer's life? You know, we've the title of the book is Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, and Spy, which is a great title for a book because every pastor wishes they were a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, but that's the secret. There's something you have. Yeah, to... yeah, yeah. Jay has. Theories I don't really want about... to be a martyr or a prophet, but I'll be a spy. <laughs> Jay has theories about certain people at Calvary, and maybe that their jobs are actually spy jobs. I like spy novels, so I he gets sort of, a little too into. I it. like spy movies and spy novels, so actually, yes, it probably does. <laughs> but so, someone doesn't know who Bonhoeffer is, give us sort of a rough summary of what you learned through his his life in this book. He is somebody who pursued education, which led him to the Lord Mm -hmm. and the Word of God, so much so that he couldn't not live it out unto his very death. No. Okay. So, like, how would you summarize, Melissa, sort of your view of what Bonhoeffer endured and what he did and sort of the life he led? Well, let's not forget, I didn't read the last half of the book. Yeah, totally. So... I don't know. (laughs) I'm just kidding. To be continued. I just think, um, yeah, everything, I totally agree with everything that Ellie said. Like, I just think his, um, the depth of his knowledge and his constant desire to know more and to follow God's heart in every situation that he was in is just totally inspiring. Yeah. I also find it fascinating because you don't normally think of a pastor becoming a spy like that's kind of intense that doesn't feel very um turn the other cheekish yeah you right know, that feels very aggressive um and i love there was a part in this book where he had kind of come to this realization he had to justify um a little white lies and things as he became the spy because he knew that it was god's truth that was prevailing and i thought that was a fascinating little um twist yeah and i thought that was Super interesting, especially sort of if you think about the life stages of individuals and Bonhoeffer's own life stage, you know, he never married, he he was engaged, but um, before he died in the concentration camp. So like he has this idealistic view of the world that he has to rationalize with like the real historical accounts of what's happening in his country, what type of leader he's under, under the World War II with Hitler and I think it's really fascinating his tensions of wrestling with the ideals that he might hold and the the truth of like the reality of day-to-day living out his faith I thought was really interesting so Jay you've talked about how influential Bonhoeffer has been in your life so what are some of the hands-on ways that you've seen his influence yeah I you know Bonhoeffer in this is throughout the book but he he is adamant about the Sermon on the Mount. So that's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And that is Jesus' uh, magnum opus of a sermon, like what the kingdom of God is, what it is to follow God, what it is to be a person of God. And so I think Bonhoeffer wrestles with that his whole life, and I find that really influential in my own life, mm-hmm. how, much, how serious he took Jesus' words to the point of like, living them out regardless of the cost for his own self. You know, 
there's a famous quote that you'll hear in sermons occasionally uh, if you've been around the church a long, long time, but it's like um, grace is free, but discipleship costs mm. is a Bonhoeffer quote. And um, I think that's a really important fact for Bonhoeffer is he saw discipling, discipleship of following Jesus is going to cost them everything. And it's really hard. But for Bonhoeffer, it gave him the most life. It led to the best life possible. And he really took Jesus's words literal as much as you can, you yeah. know, in context of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Yeah. Which I find Good. inspiring. I mean, this is fantastic, you know. Yeah. It makes me want to go back and read that with more intention in Matthew. I mean, I think we all kind of know the gist of it, but right. he probably had that thing dialed in yeah. to where he could apply it to every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every situation, wherever he found himself. Yeah, it was sort of, you know, the kingdom of God and the kingdom life was sort of the lens he he viewed the world. So if you have glasses on or you're a person who wears glasses, think about putting the kingdom of God as sort of the clarity of which you see the world. And I think Bonhoeffer does, does that really well through his life is he is always wrestling with like, this is sort of the nationalist church. You know, Germany is culpable of some horrific stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as hard as it is sometimes to think about, but like, you know, there was Christians who claimed to be Christians who were fighting for Nazi Germany. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's how do you get there? Right. We, we all ask that question. Like, how do you get there? Well, Bonhoeffer is like viewing this world through the kingdom of God. And so he's like, you can't get there through this, what they're asking you to do. You can't get there through the destruction of a people group of, of Jewish people, you know, or, the evil of uh, warlording over the world and conquering Europe and all these things that, you know, we read about, we know about through World War II history, if we said in history class or watch the History Channel or things like that or watch some great movies, but he's like living in the streets of that. And I think that's so fascinating because mm-hmm. he's trying to figure out how does Jesus call him to live in that culture? Yeah, and how, I just thought again and again of the awareness and the constant uh, being in the word and immersing yourself that it must have taken Bonhoeffer right. to see things constantly for what they were. Yeah. You know, to see the truth of the situation and God's light in it and his word in it. Um, because as we know, it's hard. Like right. every situation that we're in, it's hard to discern what the right thing is. And, you know, we can even read the same, t- two groups can read the same scripture sometime and have a completely different view on how a situation should be reacted with. And so just that, I mean, just how deeply immersed in the word and his relationship with God he must have been to be able to hold that line through his entire life. Yeah. You know, he, he wrote a book that you, you should read as a Christian. If you're ever going to be in like a, a life group or a small group, for the rest of your life or go to adult Bible study. Like if that's going to be you, you need to read this book that Bonhoeffer wrote called life together. It's like less than a hundred pages. It's, and it's fantastic. But I think one of the reasons that Bonhoeffer survived what he did and he lived how, how he did um, and mid Texas talks about it a lot. He just doesn't name it all the time, but he, he had a community. He always mm-hmm. had people around him, encouraging him, listening, discerning praying like challenging like he always was around a community from his very young family days of church on sunday night around the family piano to um, his days and teenage years and university life like bonhoeffer always had a community of people he could bounce ideas off of and thoughts and ideas and they sort of regulated him to in some extent of this idyllic view to like the reality of what was present for him and his faith. Yeah. Some of those mentors too, he got to challenge. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. And some of them never came around, but they all adored him. Right. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, he, that says a lot about him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, let's be honest, he had a great community. You know, he was super blessed through his whole spiritual life, his whole real life, to have a community of people to really encourage him. And I think that's really important for all of us. You know, I took it from the book, this time around too was like there was a huge community always around him, um, encouraging him mm-hmm. and helping him to think clearly. 
And Jay's not just saying that because he's our pastor <laughs> of community life. <laughs> no, but just kidding. <laughs> I meant correlate, yes. but not. What yeah, he's totally. Saying. No, yeah, totally. <laughs> And, you know, in Life Together, Bonhoeffer says there is no idyllic community because he tried to live it out. Yeah. And he comes to some conclusions like it doesn't work. He's like the imperfectness of people is what the ideal community is. It's the grace to live with them yeah. is where you're going to find your true faith. Which is the hardest part, right? right? Yeah. It's like <laughs> so counterintuitive, you totally. know, like in... As the community life pastor, I hear people say all the time, well, it's just not the right fit. These yep. people don't fit me. I'm like, yeah. that's actually the probably the best community you could ever be in because mm -hmm. it, you're going to have to figure out who you are and how to live with these people and how to give grace and truth to these yeah. people. Who you are in Christ. Right, yeah. 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 No doubt. No doubt. I've been stuck in communities where it, I got my head kind of swarmed with the fact that I was in this community and that really became my identity and how cool that he could bounce around from different communities and yeah. different countries and develop all these. It didn't matter because he was who he was in Christ alone. Yeah. Which is how we all should really strive to be. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things um, in the book that they talked about was when he came to the U S for a period of time and he was uh, exposed to a sort of church that he had never experienced before in the black church community in you know, New York City yeah. area. And I love like how he absorbed so much of that. And then again and again, it comes up through the book and how he carried parts of that church to the church that he ministered to in England and to, you know, students in Germany. And it just went with him everywhere. He carried yeah. part of it. Yeah. You know, Bonhoeffer, I think, and Metaxas talks about this, viewed himself in exile and I think the black church for him was a people group that knew who he was because they were in exile too mm. in some ways of like who they were and around the turn of the century coming out of, you know, the Great War and World War II and the New York City through the Great Depression, yeah. all those type of things really influenced, um, I think, Bonhoeffer in some really wonderful ways. And, it, you know, Metaxas says he has criticism Bono criticizes the American church yeah. in some ways, you know, and I think they're really good criticisms and really thought provoking criticisms. And you should read this book because it sort of gives you this overview of this guy's life and the wonderful, wonderful story he lived, even though it was cut short through um, Nazi Germany. You yeah. know, the crazy thing is, and I love this about the end of the book, it's only three weeks until that concentration camp is liberated yeah isn't that crazy like he is so close to finally living through the war and you know that's part of the sadness for me is i want to see what bonhoeffer says when he's like 60 and 70 years old yeah you know compared to what he's saying when he's 20 and 30 you know when he's a young man yeah but, but what a what a uh beautiful view of the gift of God putting the right people in the right moments of history in the right time and thinking about that in our own life. Like, right. I mean, none of us in this room are Bonhoeffers. Sorry to yeah. break it to you, Jay. I'm not a spy. <laughs> <laughs> but God did put us where we are in this time, in this moment, yeah. for a specific reason, in our communities, in this church, in all of these areas. And to think about that you know, from that perspective of his divine plan yeah. and our part in it is so, it's such a beautiful picture. Yeah. And it's mutual beneficial. It's benefiting you to be in this community. It's benefiting us for you to be in this. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's so wonderful how God does that. Like, it's just not give and take, you know what I mean? It's this really wonderful thing for the community to be fully present with each other and fully present with God. And I think Bonhoeffer encourages us to do that. In so many ways. Yeah, and to add the seriousness and the accountability, like you were talking about, Ellie, that I think a lot of our community is missing. So yeah, I that's love good. that. So, Ellie, you know, we, when we talk about this on the book list, we, we always finish this with, who would you recommend this book for? You know, it's a big, daunting book. It's 500 pages. It's, it's so well written. It's super easy to read. It's not like, you know, scholarly textual work <laughs> i think it's a great question i don't consider myself very smart what? and so i know i know but still it was hard for me to read i had to look a lot of things up you know 
It was a hard read for me. However, it was so engaging and I learned so much and I slowed down. So to me, this book would be perfect for someone who wants to read and immerse themselves in a portrait, Mm. an important Mm. portrait, one that is like a living example of what it looks like to follow Christ. Um, I read and reread and reread, not necessarily because I had to look up the word ecumenic, what is it? Ecumenical? Yeah, ecumenical. Ec- ecum- yeah. yeah, see, yeah. that's like a very religious word. That was yeah, new to me. Totally. Anyway, um, but because I wanted to reread again and again what he had written and what he was about and learn from it. Yeah. And so I came out of this book a changed person. I felt challenged. Mm-hmm. I felt convicted. I felt inspired. And so um, it would be good for people in community, but it would definitely also be good for someone um, who wanted to settle in a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it does take time to pull it apart. And I would say the same thing, um, like, you know, just an hour at a time or whatever you can devote to it. Like, I know Jay can read it in a weekend, but it's a little intense, Jay. It, sorry, it was. I, yeah, but fine. I love, he's it's a fine. hero. I get it. Yeah. Um, but yes, and also... It, when you have the time to dive into some other works by Bonhoeffer and really, you know, find out like this gives such a, a nice picture of his family and his history. I mean, like you were saying, it is a portrait. That is a great description for it. And then to go and read his actual works with all of that in your mind, I think would be such a beautiful thing to be able to do. That's my plan. Yeah, yeah. I like it. It's a good one. And, and also, if you're a fan of The Sound of Music, because I'm sorry, but his like idyllic childhood, right? the house in the country with the nannies that are playing around picnics the piano under the... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, and that's true. Like, if, you're a, if you like biographies and you want a really good Christian work of a like Christian faith lived out in amazing ways, this is a great book for you. And maybe, you know, read within the context of, like, your family. Like, if you have teenagers, you know, high school, late high school teenagers to read historical accounts of Nazi Germany, faith, and Christianity, this would be a great recommend to read with them. Um, You know, a book club. If you're, like, into a serious book, this is not your typical, you know, what you think of book club. But if you're into a really, you know, thoughtful, deep, discussing type book club, this might be work. I will say I cried, though. I did cry. Yeah. yeah at too. the end. You can't not. You're so invested in this man. Oh, oh I yeah. didn't even get to the end, and I cried. Yeah, there's, <laughs> and you know, also, there's a, a great, there's a DVD of this now. I didn't tell you all that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, there's a, I haven't seen the movie or the documentary that they put together after this book, but, um, and then also, you know, like always, I recommend books at the end of this, um, Life Together, which is sort of his little treatise or little book written about um, community and then cost of the discipleship is his reflections of reading through the sermons of the mount sermon on the mount and it's not plural <laughs> sermon, <laughs> There's only sermon one. of the mount and um, that is a great book like if you're going to read two other books from Bonhoeffer if you're going to read two other books as a Christian I would say read those two books because they're awesome. super influential on That's my great. life and so many a life and you know here's the thing like He's he's crazy because so many famous people, famous Christians, have read him, like read read his works, considered yeah. his works that so we would love. Legacy is just incredible. Yeah, long lasting. Long lasting. One of the heroes of the faith for the last twentieth century, and I think really good book for you at Calvary to read. All right, are we done? I think we're done. The, Enjoy it. The music is in the background. That means, so that, means done. that means we're getting close to being done. Ellie, thank you so much for being here <laughs> today. For being great here. Time. We Thanks love having fun. you here today. Thanks, it was so was fun. fun. Thanks for reading this book. Yeah, I'm that so was glad. a real commitment. I'm so glad you shoved this in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out the door. Hey, don't tell everyone how I read. <laughs> I'll do this, okay? Hey, uh, thanks, Calvary. Let us know. You can always reach out to us at theweekly at calvarybible.com. Let us know if you've read this book, if you picked up this book. Let us know if you find this book really hard to read or really fun to read or in what context you're reading it in. Like was said, we always just want to hear from you. Also, you can always do us a solid. Go to the iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Give us a review. We only take five stars. That's what Thomas says all the time. <laughs> so if it's anything I'll, less than I'll five stars. I'll take four. I'll be honest. 
you should read a review on the iTunes. This is like, this is my five star review or something like that. Like, <laughs> someone, so good. So I good. love it. Hey, Calvary, we love you. Thanks for tuning in. We hope to see you very soon. Stay connected at calvarybible.com. We're out. <laughs>